I want to tell you about a very lowly form of life, a slime mold. It is the present-day counterpart of the primordial ooze that appeared on Earth many, many eons ago. The descendant of this primordial ooze, the substance which gives life to all plants and animals, we call it protoplasm. Now let us go into the woods and collect the protoplasm of a slime mold. We shall probably find it growing on an old stump, such as this one. And now here's better luck. Golden yellow protoplasm glistening in the sun. No shape to it, for it's always changing shape. No cells, no tissue, just protoplasm. One protoplasmic mass with many living nuclei. Having collected the protoplasm in nature, we can now grow it in the laboratory. Here is a culture of the slime mold Fissarum, growing so luxuriantly that is crawled out of its culture dish. Here we have a closer view of the culture. In the center is an island on which the food is placed. Slime molds are very fond of oatmeal. And surrounding the island is a moat of water. And here a still nearer view of a small part of the hole, such as we would see if we used a hand lens. Remember, this is not tissue, not an aggregation of cells, but just protoplasm. And through it all, there is constant streaming. And now the protoplasm is seen through the microscope. The movement never ceases as long as there is life, except during hibernation in wintertime. Here is a younger portion of the plasmodium. Could we but understand the cause of this constant movement, we should be nearer to an understanding of what life is. We turn now to a typical medical problem, anesthesia. When the normal protoplasm is treated with carbon dioxide, it slowly goes to sleep. Here is another specimen. Now it too is slowly going to sleep. Now a few minutes later we get the first indications of recovery. And a quarter of an hour later, almost the same culture back again. Healthy, normal protoplasm. And an hour later, we can't tell any difference between this protoplasm and that before anesthesia. We made a discovery that the rhythmic forces in protoplasm are even more basic than the flow. For when the protoplasm recovers, it doesn't just start flowing, it resumes as though it had been flowing all the while. In a moment now, the protoplasm slowly quiets down. Note that there is a slight nervous shock just before anesthesia takes place. Let me illustrate what I just said, that when the protoplasm recovers, it will be on the same curve. The rhythm has continued underneath, so to speak, even though the protoplasm has been asleep there is still something going on. We must be very close indeed to the question, what is life? We come now to one of the greatest problems in biology. What makes protoplasm flow? To say it is life is no answer. The biologist wants to know the physics and chemistry of protoplasmic streaming. I had an idea. Perhaps the outer layer of protoplasm pulsates and pumps the inner substance just as does the human heart. Here is my proof. What you see is the same protoplasm, but now speeded up by time-lapse photography. The rhythmic period of the pulsation is, as one would expect, the same as that of the rhythmic flow. Here's a primitive heart, one drop of protoplasm pulsating out, in, out, in. If a theory is a really good one, it should fit all cases. I therefore studied chaos, a giant amoeba with many nuclei, and hunted for rhythmic pulsations. I speeded up the photography, but still no evidence of a rhythm.
rhythmic movement, but not rhythmic pulsation. At least we couldn't find it. The theory is an excellent one, but it isn't true. Mind you, the rhythm is there. Rhythmical motion is a fundamental property of living matter, but it is not the cause of the protoplasmic streaming. Both are the result of a rhythmic force which we have not yet discovered. Then along came Camille and he said to me, let's measure the horsepower of this living machine. I'll do it by applying pressure or suction, just as one breaks an engine. From these measurements, Camille drew curves which depict the rhythmic flow of protoplasm. These curves, such as this one, Dr. Camille analyzed as a physicist would a curve in harmonics. I felt that biology had at last become an exact science. Note in this curve the little irregularities at the top to the right. Note that they always recur. This led to a remarkable discovery, that there is not one rhythm in protoplasm, but many rhythms. Protoplasm is a polyrhythmic system. Later in Japan, Dr. Kamiya measured the electrical force or potential of flowing protoplasm and found the same rhythm there as he had found when he measured pressure. In short, mechanical pressure and electrical pressure parallel each other. The meaning of this is far-reaching, but just what it is we have not yet found out, though I have an idea and I shall tell you about it in a moment. I want to show you now the nervous activity which muscle fibers display, first shown to me by my colleague Dr. Cookson. Notice the rhythmic procession of waves, which represent impulses radiating from nervous centers. These I like to call excitation foci. Remember, too, that in a plasmodium there is not one rhythm, but many rhythms, such as you see here. I concluded that all forms of motion in protoplasm are the result of nervous impulses emanating from excitation foci. These rhythmic waves in muscle fibers are basically the same as those you saw in the protoplasm of a primitive slime mold. Synchronized with these visible waves are electrical impulses, which can be measured and recorded. Electrical impulses, therefore, are responsible for protoplasmic movement, for the contraction of muscle, and the transmission of messages along nerve fibers. This is my theory, and this is as near as we have gotten to a physical interpretation of life forces. I think you'll agree that protoplasm is a very remarkable substance. Often I talk about it as if it had intelligence and my colleagues raise their eyebrows. I don't say it is intelligent, but it does often do the intelligent thing. And after all, we are made of protoplasm.